from St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. In the Missouri legislature, House Democrats recently found themselves backing Republican Governor Mike Parson when they spoke against a House budget bill that provided less money than the governor wanted for state employee raises. But last week, a Missouri Senate committee fully restored the money allocated for the raises. This action backed Parson's initial proposal while also reversing the House's decision. On this episode of Politically Speaking, I talk with Representative Peter Meredith about the Senate's decision, along with other aspects of the state budget, including the billions of dollars in federal money Missouri is tasked with allocating. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people. I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. Welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, State House and Politics reporter Sarah Kellogg. Joining me via video conferencing, he is a Democratic representative for the 80th District, which represents part of St. Louis City. He's also the ranking member of the House Budget Committee. The Representative Peter Meredith. Thank you so much, Representative, for joining us on this snow day. I stay, it's snowing here. I know it's not snowing yet in St. Louis, yeah? No, not yet. Still just rain here. Before we get started, uh, would you just quickly describe, talk about your district and remind our listeners where it is? Sure. So uh, I like to say Targrove Park is the middle of my district, uh, but uh, Targrove area, I've got Shaw neighborhood, Targrove uh, South, and then uh, Southwest Gardens, the Hill, Kings Highway Hills, and then little bits of neighborhoods around there, including where I live in Targrove East. So I guess we have a lot to talk about. Let's kind of get started. How do you feel that session is going so far? Well, it's it's an unusual session, to say the least. Um, of course, I, I think the, the main story of it is that the Senate is completely dysfunctional right now, not able to pass anything, not really even able to have a normal conversation on the floor, um, because uh, about half the Republican caucus is uh, fighting uh, really pretty viciously with the other half of the Republican caucus. Um, and, you know, it's a, this this constant fight of, Who's far enough to the right? So that that's sort of putting a damper on a whole lot of action in uh, session so far. And even on the House side, I would say we're moving pretty slowly, um, doing a lot less, maybe in part because of the inaction over in the Senate. But I think also just in part because a lot of the leadership hasn't really figured out what their plan is for the session. Um, and so we've got some emergencies that we're trying to get done, governor priorities. And weirdly, I'm finding myself as a Democrat in the position of defending and advocating for the governor's priorities right now, which is a nice change of pace, I've got to say. But um, it's made for an unusual session, to say the least. You mentioned the Senate. One of your colleagues this week, Representative Don Roan, uh, admonished the Senate for not getting work done. I guess I'd like your thoughts on that. Is this year even different from prior years, you think? This is not the first time that Don Roan has stood on the floor and admonished the Senate. Um, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before that the Senate essentially adjourned early without passing a whole bunch of, uh, of House Republican priorities. And I, I think he nearly shut down session on the House side and said, well, then we shouldn't pass any of the Senate bills. Um, so this sort of dynamic between the House and Senate isn't entirely new, but I think that it has hit um, a new height, to be sure. Uh, the, the level of dysfunction we're seeing on the Senate side is pretty unprecedented, I think. And Honestly, it, it's in part because of the level of vitriol happening over there. You know, we always fight tooth and nail um, over things we disagree on. That That's part of the job. But in the Senate, there's always been some element of respect and decorum in the debate. And right now, when they've got um, the folks from the conservative caucus literally attacking the, the staff um, that work for people, that's that's always been off limits. Um, and, and using kind of the kind of language that has generally not been acceptable over there, we're seeing it just kind of fall apart. And so I think those in the House that are trying to keep working, um, for whichever reasons, I mean, frankly, for, for policies I hate or policies that I strongly agree with, they're just trying to do their jobs. And they're looking over at the Senate saying, are you kidding me? 
you guys can't even vote on a bill? We're a, you know, a month and a half in, and you, you talked about this a little bit already, but do, do you feel the legislature is where it needs to be right now? Oh, God, no. Um, I, well, look, I, I'm in a super minority. Uh, ideologically, I'm, I'm uh, far from the majority. And so I've, I've never thought our legislature is where it ought to be. I mean, Missouri is at the bottom of the list of states on so many important metrics now. I mean, everything from economic measures like the, the, the least GDP growth of all of our neighboring states in the last few years, um, population stagnation, but things like infant and maternal mortality were the worst. Our, we've got the lowest funding of schools of any state in the country. We've got the lowest paid teachers. We've got the lowest paid state workers. At, all across the board, we're falling behind. And so I would say that that is because of a legislature that is not meeting the needs of the people. Um, it's a legislature too focused on undoing votes of the people, weakening democracy, um, not taking federal dollars and using them for things like Medicaid expansion. But this year, again, it's it's a different kind of not where we're supposed to be because it's not just yeah ideologically I don't agree with they are with where they are, but functionally. Uh, functionally, we're not really operating as a functional government. We're barely getting by. And honestly, this conversation we're having right now about pay of state employees, I think exemplifies that problem. And so we got a long way to go to be where we ought to be as a legislature right now. You've given a nice little preview of like all of my topics that I want for the episode. So that's kind of a, a little sneak peek. I, I know I'm hitting you with a lot of predictive questions, but with what you've seen, do you think a lot's going to get done this year? Yeah, so I will never try and predict the Senate. Uh, I have I have learned that that's a bad idea. I will work with them and try and uh, get their help with a lot of things that we agree on. But predicting them, uh, -uh. Um, that said, you know, historically, the Senate breaks down a lot. Uh, I don't think we've seen it happen to this degree, but almost always they find a way to break through the gridlock and then pass a whole bunch of things I don't like. Usually. A uh, whole bunch of really awful things for our state end up getting through. I think that's a likely scenario. Um, there's also a, a, a more optimistic scenario in my mind where the breakthrough happens where they realize they have a governing bipartisan majority. And maybe it happens with this pay plan here at the beginning, or maybe it happens with the governor's budget request where they say, you know what, we're done letting the conservative caucus hold us hostage. And we're going to start just passing things that we have a bipartisan agreement on. Even if it's not the Republicans agreeing, we have a majority that can get it done. Um, that's my optimistic approach. And, you know, we see the women of the Senate really take the lead in that often, where they they stood and held the floor last week in a really powerful way of saying, this is not how we have to behave, guys. Um, and I, we'll see if that actually leads to any change. Now then, alternatively, um, there really is a scenario where they just can't get along enough to pass anything. And we see mostly gridlock and mostly things, ju bills just die. And hopefully if that happens, we at least get through some of the really necessary things that we have to get through, like the budget. Um, but frankly, there's a scenario where even that doesn't happen. And I, I sure hope that's not where we are. So let's let's get into the budget. Um, we'll start with the emergency supplemental, um, which is the first of two supplemental bills that the legislature is you know going to pass. The the Senate amended the House version of this emergency supplemental. The biggest change is that it restores the funding for the state worker plan back to what Parson proposed, which is around you know seven million more dollars. What are your thoughts on this decision? Well, I'm pretty excited that the Senate has gone back to the governor's position on that and a variety of other things. I mean, on the House side, we fought pretty hard against the changes that, that frankly, just the budget chair by himself made um, to the governor's plan. Um, that big change on the pay plan was it took about eight, seven, eight million dollars out of the governor's pay plan. Governor's pay plan is about a hundred million dollar total cost. It took about seven or eight million out of that, but the entirety of that seven or eight million came from the raises for the very lowest paid workers. So those that make under $12 or between under $15, really. Um, so for example, a worker making $12 under the governor's pay plan would have been raised $3 an hour up to $15 an hour. But a worker making $12 an hour under um, the house version would only get a 66 cent an hour raise. And as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> we cannot have a functioning government if we're not paying 
anywhere close to competitive wages in this market. And a 66 cent an hour raise isn't going to cut it. Um, and we've got all of our statewides agree with this. You know, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kehoe, I asked him in budget hearing last week uh, whether he supports it. And he said, yeah, you know, um, as somebody who lives in Jeff City, I see state workers in front of me in the grocery store buying their food with food stamps. And that's just not acceptable. And, and now that, that kind of speaks to the idea of is it morally okay for the state to pay people so little that they can't afford to live without food stamps? But there's just this functional reality. We have vacancies. We cannot hire. We can't, we can't do basic services like snow removal or answer the phones when people are trying to uh, enroll in Medicaid because we're not paying people enough to compete in this market. So I'm really excited that the Senate restored that full pay plan. It costs us nothing in the scheme of the money we have right now. Heck, the supplemental bill alone was $6 billion, and this is an $8 million with an M cost. And the only people impacted are our lowest paid workers. Come on, guys. So yeah, Senate is moving in the right direction. They also fixed some of the other things, the education funding. I can get into that if you want to, but um, pay plan is the biggest issue. Yeah. Another thing the Senate did with this money is they didn't set the minimum, you know, no 15 minimum set. Uh, Senator Dan Hegeman, chair of the committee, you know, he said he wanted to let the market decide it would allow departments to get to the target that Parson wanted. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this what you proposed as an amendment to the House bill? Sure is. Isn't that amazing how that works? Um, yeah, no, it's it's exactly what I said on the floor on the House side. And to, to be honest, I mean, the governor's proposal didn't actually say in the budget uh, $15. It said a raise to a baseline wage and um, and a five and a half percent above that. Um, it's ironically, uh, the, the rhetoric about what the governor's actual plan was in implementing it was, was bringing up to 15. But what the House members that didn't like it didn't like was this idea of mandating a minimum wage. Um, but of course, the amendment that they did actually did put $15 an hour and $12 an hour as the minimum wages for workers in our state, depending on which job they're in. So they were actually creating the very minimum wage that they said they were against. Um, but yeah, it was it was nice to see the, the Senate point out the same thing I was pointing out on the House side when I tried to restore this. I'm taking out that language. They have the flexibility. They can take back the minimum wage, the, 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 the 15 base that they're trying to raise it to. If in three months they don't think they need that, they don't have to. We're not forcing it. But this idea of we shouldn't mandate what state department's pay was just the funniest thing to me been that's literally what our budget does every year mandates what salaries are do you expect pushback from the house on this change you know how much and what do you think the outcome might be we'll see um you know i've talked to a whole lot of republicans even back when we first passed it in the house side um that that said they agreed with us and they agreed with the governor on on this and that they would support that after the senate restored it uh, <laughs> um but they didn't want to go against their budget chair because he's a very powerful person in the House. Um, when it comes to the budget, he pretty well single-handedly writes most of the budget. And if folks in their caucus go against him, he punishes them by not supporting the one thing they're fighting for in the budget. Um, so I, my hope is now that it comes back from the Senate, there's more of a will to just say, hey, let's get this done. We were all supposed to get this done by February 1st when the governor announced this. He he and the budget chair and the appropriate chair in the Senate all said, yes, we have to do this. Yes, we support this. Yes, let's get it done by February 1st. Here we are, what, February 17th? And uh, and it's still not done. So we just need to move it out. I think we have enough Republicans to do that. That said, budget chair is probably still going to push back. Uh, we may have to go to conference committee and, and fight about some of the details. But I, I am hopeful that we've got the votes to get it done. So the other big modification the Senate did to this supplemental budget is removing the close the gap program from this budget bill entirely. You know, what are your thoughts on that? So it's a complicated one. I think it's a really interesting idea. Close the gap. Um, uh, this idea of giving a little bit of extra dollars to uh, families who need to do remedial education, tutoring, things like that to help get kids caught up after last year. Um, the problem is this was entirely a creation of one person in the house and he really hadn't fleshed out how it was going to work um so he set it up so it goes to a private vendor there's going to be a contract with a private company that's going to make money off this and then it's not entirely clear on how the money gets actually distributed to families and when we started doing the math and working it out 
it might be that a family applies thinking they're going to get $1,500 that he sort of said the program would be, but then because of the number of applicants, they actually only get $200. And I think that creates a lot of problems, especially if the families have to come up with the money in the first place to pay for the tutoring in order to apply to get reimbursed by the state. Well, the, the lowest income families are going to have trouble coming up with the money in the first place. And then if they don't get the, re the full reimbursement they thought they were going to get initially, it could actually create a lot of problems. So I, I think it hadn't really been fully vetted. And on the other hand, where he was taking the money from was things like after school programs, $20 million of it came out of the bucket that the Desi was spending on after school programs, which we know are so needed for this very purpose of helping kids catch up. So uh, I think we should absolutely keep having the conversation about an idea like that. Look, it, <laughs> frankly, it sounds like the Biden child tax credit to me, just less efficient <laughs> um, because people have to apply for it. They've got to go through paperwork. They've got to get a reimbursement. Um, I'd almost rather get them to agree, okay, let's expand <laughs> Biden's child tax credit. But I don't think they'll admit that that might actually do the job better than what they're proposing. So, you know, there's this supplemental budget, there's the regular budget, there's going to be another supplemental budget, there's also ARPA funding. You know, I guess kind of talking about ARPA, which is, uh, for our listeners, the American Rescue Plan Act money, I have to be clear about that because I say ARPA all the time. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on it? I've heard it's going to possibly be one bill. Have you heard the same? And when do you think this is all going to get started? Yeah, so honestly, this is the other thing that makes this year completely unlike any that I've had in the legislature or honestly, any of my predecessors have had. We have just an unprecedented amount of money, um, and it's largely thanks to the federal government sending us money to, to invest in things that have been long underinvested uh, in. So the uh, procedurally, I guess, the way that we expect it to happen is um, – We've been sitting on this money for a long time. We have like $10 billion in the bank right now, um, and we've got more coming. And so a lot of us have been saying, hey, guys, we really need to be moving on getting this money out the door. Um, but it looks like the, the ARPA money, which is a big chunk of it, we're going to be working on um, as part of the regular budget this year. It's just separated into a new budget book, House Bill 20. This is, this is just wonky details. But that bill will be where we have a whole bunch of things that are one-time expenses with ARPA money. So I, I, we started going through that budget book last week, and honestly, it is going to be a lot of work because every new page, it's not just tweaking an existing program out there, looking through the Department of Education's budget and seeing what's working, what isn't. This is all new stuff, right? Like a $25 million bucket for... Um, for grants for uh, for small businesses, we've got to vet that how it's going to work, how the how the how the grants are going to be given out. Then there's a two hundred fifty million dollar proposal for um, community development grants. What that means, gosh, I I'm not sure any of us really know yet. So there is a whole lot of work to do to flesh out the details of how this money is going out to make sure it's actually going into things that will grow the state. We've got a, a 400 million they're talking about for rural broadband, something that we, we've been desperate for for years. Everyone supports, but Republicans have been unwilling to put money toward it. Well, now Biden's sending us money for it. So a lot of the money I'm hopeful will get put in that budget. We'll see there is some pushback from Republicans in the House that are saying they don't want to spend all of it yet. Um, they think some of them even have had the gall to say we should send it back to the federal government um, to go toward the federal debt. Um, so we will see how that moves. Now then, there will be another budget um, bill even after that, we think, that will deal with a lot of the infrastructure dollars that are still being worked out. And that may be another five or more billion dollars that we're investing in our state. So, I mean, I'm excited as can be about the ways that we can use this money, uh, looking at Things like expanding after school programs, like I mentioned, or early childhood education or rural broadband or just updating our roads and bridges that are long overdue for maintenance or um, uh, in investing in low income housing uh, or housing for the unhoused. You know, right now we've got 185,000 units short of, of what MHDC says the need is for low income housing units because we don't really have many ways we invest in low-income housing in the state. So there is all kinds of stuff we can do with this money, and it's a pretty incredible opportunity. 
I want your thoughts on on waiting until now to begin appropriating this. Should the state have started earlier, even with this deadline of 2024 at the end of it? Yes. Um, there's no question, uh, as far as I'm concerned. We should have been working on this all through the interim last year. Um, now, there was a subcommittee that was meeting. They met a couple of times in that interim. But uh, honestly, we should have been actually passing uh, spending plans for some of it, um, even if it was just parts at a time. Um, this money is just sitting in our treasury, and our treasury doesn't even gain interest at a normal market rate because they're not allowed to. Um, and so, especially when we have some inflation happening and changes in the market, we're not doing us, ourselves any good by sitting on the dollars. We need to put them into the state. Um, it, these investments are long overdue. Are you worried at all that money is going to be left on the table? Yes, uh, very. We have folks running things right now that just generally aren't inclined towards spending money. Um, they generally don't like government spending money on things. And so there's pushback on just about every idea out there. Um, I am very worried that, especially with as long as it's taken so far to even just get moving on this, that um, the resistance will be strong and we won't get all the way there. And the deadlines will start hitting sooner than we think. Um, some of the deadlines are coming up. Uh, the, the school money has to be appropriated very quickly or we risk losing it. Uh, that's why we've got an emergency supplemental on it. Um, so these deadlines are going to come fast. Fast is not what these guys do well, especially when it's spending money. So we'll see. But I'm trying. We need to take a quick little break, but we'll be right back. And we're back on Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio's State House and Politics reporter, Sarah Kellogg. Joining me is Democratic Representative Peter Meredith, who represents the 80th District, which includes part of St. Louis City. Let's get back into it. So I want to talk about uh, constitutional amendments, because that seems to me to be a bulk of what the House is kind of addressing right now, either perfecting or advancing. Uh, I want to start with, and you mentioned it earlier, initiative petition amendments. One that's passed in the House, another's been perfected. The one that's kind of on its way to the Senate would raise the number of signatures needed for an issue to get on the ballot and then raise the threshold of how many votes is needed for uh, from a simple majority to two-thirds to, to pass. So you've spoken about this on the floor, but what are your thoughts on not only this one, but the other initiative petition reform attempt? For the most part, I hate it. Uh, I, I believe really strongly in the initiative petition process, the ability for voters to go directly to uh, the ballot and say that they want something to be law. Um, too often, historically, and, and both parties are guilty of this, um, the legislature just doesn't do what people are saying needs to be done. And we can point to all kinds of things about this. And, and so eventually, the people have to say, fine, we're going to gather signatures and put this on the ballot. And unfortunately, the current uh, majority doesn't like that very much. Uh, they've, they've seen it over the last few years be used to pass some more progressive policies that they have been actively opposing, whether that's um, an increase to the minimum wage, uh, Medicaid expansion is the most recent that really made them mad, um, or clean Missouri, you know, a, all variety of things that voters have done over the heads of the legislature. Now, I think it's gotten more extreme because now uh, a lot of this had to be done as constitutional amendments. And that's really the fault of the legislature, in, in my view, um, because over the last number of years, we've seen time and time again where voters vote for something, they put it on the ballot, they vote for it, they pass it overwhelmingly and put it into statute. And then a year later, the Republican legislature goes in and undoes it. And so voters started to say, well, fine, I guess we're going to have to put this in the Constitution so that you can't undo it without us getting to vote for it again. And so that's what started happening. That's what happened with um, Medicaid expansion most recently. That really upset the GOP. Um, they've spent over 10 years now actively fighting against Medicaid expansion. Year after year, we've said this is our number one priority for the state, and they have voted it down. So when the people went over their heads and did this, they said, all right, we're done. We're not dealing with ballot initiatives anymore. And now they're trying to pass things that will make it harder for voters to do that. Whether it's just the conversation of, should it be so easy to amend our constitution, which there's a valid conversation to be had there, I think, um, if not for the problem that they have caused. Um, or should they just make it harder entirely for voters to do anything? without the legislature's approval. And I find those far more offensive, personally. 
I won't ask you to predict what the Senate's going to do, but let's say, you know, this particular proposed amendment go- does make it through the legislature. Do you feel that it'll be an uphill battle for people who do want this to make it tougher for initiative to get on the ballot to get voters to vote for it? Yes. So I think when voters are asked an honest question about this, voters believe in the ability for them to make decisions um, without the legislature. I mean, voters on both sides of the aisle get frustrated with the legislature um, and want to be able to pass things that way. I think the challenge is what, what they keep doing is trying to come up with ways to put things on the ballot that frankly try to trick voters. Um, uh, most recently, yesterday, we, we saw one perfected in the House that um, would make it virtually impossible for a ballot initiative to ever pass successfully. Virtually impossible. I mean, you might as well just take it away entirely. But they do it in a way that the way it'll be worded on the ballot to a lot of people at the first glance is going to sound like common sense, where it says, shall the Constitution be amended so that um, a majority of registered voters is required to pass a ballot initiative? Well, <laughs> most people are going to hear that and at first go, well, isn't that the case? A majority of voters. The, the, the change that they're making is it's a majority of the total number of registered voters in the state. That's 2.1 million right now. Now, even in our peak elections, like Trump's election last year um, or two years, whatever, the, the, the presidential race, we had 3 million people, a, a, a new record high, 3 million people turn out to vote. Even in that election, that means it would have taken a 70% vote in order to pass one of these ballot initiatives. But to make matters even worse, the governor has the ability to schedule these elections for whenever he wants. So just like Medicaid expansion, he he intentionally put it on the August ballot instead of the November ballot because it would be lower turnout and they thought they had a better chance of beating it then. Well, if they have to get 2.1 million people to vote yes in order to pass it, he can schedule it for any election he wants when there aren't even 2.1 million people turning out to vote, let alone voting yes. So we could have a 100% vote at the ballot, but because it's a low turnout election, they say, well, still doesn't pass. Effectively, they're making it so that it doesn't exist. But they're wording it in such a way, like I said, that they think voters might actually vote for it. In other cases, they put things on the ballot like, uh, like the first two questions sound simple and popular. And then the third question they word in a confusing way, but it's the thing they really care about. And that's the thing that voters don't like. Well, let's get into that one, which is this is Medicaid constitutional amendment. I know that's the one you're referring to. So, you know, this constitutional amendment, you know, it's been perfected. It hasn't passed the House yet. But, you know, do you just kind of want to talk about this proposed amendment and and what it would do? Well, they just won't give up. Uh, (laughs) This Medicaid expansion fight, that's what this is all about with this this ballot stuff, like I said. And and this one, the, the same guy, Cody Smith, the budget chair, that, that convinced them to, to try and defund Medicaid expansion in violation of the Constitution last year. The Supreme Court unanimously said, no, you can't do that, which is what we told them on the floor all along. Um, and now he's saying, well, even now, he's going to try yet again, now that Medicaid expansion is the law, and undo it at the ballot and basically take out the words that the, that the voters put in last time. But... In addition to that, he takes two things that really don't belong in the Constitution, especially according to folks that don't think we should be amending the Constitution so much, um, and and putting them in there in order to make the question one that voters might actually pass. And that is, first, they, they mess with this unusual situation we have where we reimburse hospitals for some of the times that they treat mostly kids from out of state that are on Medicaid. They're only using federal dollars. They're only using... The, the, the taxes that hospitals pay for this purpose. But it allows them to put a question on the ballot that just says, shall Medicaid benefits only be eligible or be, be paid for Missouri residents? Well, most Missouri people are going to say, well, yeah, we shouldn't be spending Medicaid dollars. If they were told all the details, they might not agree with that. But that question sounds more palatable. Then they've got this long thing about work requirements, which we all know in truth, just work to kick people who are working off of Medicaid. But if you just say, should people receiving Medicaid be required to try and work or try and uh, participate in community projects? Most people say, yeah. 
So now those are the first two questions on the ballot. And the third one just says, shall the legislature have the authority to control appropriations around Medicaid? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in general, the legislature has the power of appropriations, so that sounds right. But what they mean by it is, can we undo the language you just put in requiring us to fund Medicaid expansion? And so it's this intentionally deceptive language to try and get voters to undo what we just voted for, all in an effort to take health care away from people. So I want to move on to kind of just the last kind of section, goals in general. So are you still optimistic about this session? <laughs> in this job, I have found I swing wildly between uh, hopeless optimism and, uh, and hopelessness, um, <laughs> really. Uh, some days I, I really feel like there is so much good we can do this year, um, especially when I see that the governor has a, a really pretty reasonable budget he's put forward. He's looking to invest um, all these dollars that we have in ways that I, I strongly agree with. There's probably a lot more I would want, but there's a lot of good that can be done there. And there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on a lot of that stuff. So that that makes me very optimistic. Other days, I see the power of the, the sort of right-wing propaganda that is getting further and further out there. And really managing to hold hostage the good stuff and control the agenda on passing the bad stuff. So um, some days I fall back into, frankly, why do I bother? <laughs> um, some days that is definitely the question I'm asking myself. But other days I see good things happen. I see um, us, us manage to, even on little things like getting a, the Department of uh, Social Services to, to stop kicking people off of Medicaid because of false information about them moving out of state. This was a big thing that was happening a couple of weeks ago. And because a number of us uh, raised the issue and, and, and contacted them, they halted it. So there's good stuff that happens even outside of legislation that we do. And the fact that the department worked with us on that and listened and responded gives me a lot of hope. In previous years, we haven't necessarily had departments that are that responsive. Um, and it's a sign of a little bit more bipartisanship and reasonableness in some areas of government, at least. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fall on the side of optimism. What are some bills that you have an eye on, both things that are making you really excited or, or even things that are maybe making you apprehensive? Well, I'll, I'll say most of my excitement is around the budget. I, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, hope for the, the bills that I believe the strongest in. Uh, maybe the one with the best chance uh, would be um, legalizing cannabis. Um, that's something that I've, I've been pushing for since I was first elected. Um, I really, really don't think we should be locking people up for, uh, for using marijuana. Um, I, I think it's been a huge problem of over-incarceration and kind of turning people into criminals over something that shouldn't be. Um, there does seem to be a lot of momentum, a bipartisan momentum for the first time I've seen uh, in getting behind a legislative change on that. Um, we'll see. I, I'm not very excited about the, the measure that is gather, that gathering signatures to go on the ballot for that. So I'm hopeful that maybe we can get ahead of it for a change and actually pass something. We don't do that very often. But aside from that, I, I would say I'm mostly concerned about bills like the bills that, that make it harder to vote or make it harder to get a ballot initiative passed um, or uh, bills that, that are censoring teachers and um, saying they can't teach racism. Uh, I, I think those are some of the biggest things. There's also school funding issues that I really worry about. There's a huge push for privatization of our schools that is about defunding our public schools. And I'm very worried about a lot of that this year. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say I'm super optimistic about the legislation, but I've got a lot of optimism, as we've already talked about in the budget. Well, that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Representative Meredith, for joining me on the show. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is a part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. You can follow me on Twitter at Sarah K. Kellogg. That's two L's, two G's. Representative Meredith, where can people find you on the internet where you want to be found? <laughs> I'm most active probably on Facebook. Uh, I write long, detailed, wordy posts about what's happening in the legislature. Uh, Facebook slash Peter Meredith, I think, uh, if you spell the last name right. And then I'm at Peter Fermo on Twitter. Until next time, so long.